Welcome to QDL. QDL is your look at who and what is making news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. Um, Solving problems can be hard. Uh, we know that, particularly in our field. Sometimes we are so bogged down in our own biases, our own perceptions, or, or even past experiences that we can't see clearly. And even when we're aware that we're doing this, we're aware of our own biases, it can still be difficult to break through those ingrained behaviors and habits. Well, maybe art can help. And I don't mean putting pretty pictures up in your office so you can chill out at the end of a tough day. I'm talking about learning how to view art and how that can teach you a different way of tackling problems. Um, or as today's guest is, uh, puts it in her book, art finds a way for the mind to make new connections. With us today is Amy E. Herman, author of Fixed, how to perfect the fine art of problem solving. Amy teaches organizations how to problem solve by learning how to look at art. Hi, Amy. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Dirk. Thank you so much for having me today. Pleasure to be here. Sure, no problem. And did I get that right? You teach people how to look at art and then translate those lessons into problem solving? Exactly right. I call it connecting the dots. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I teach them to connect the dots, how to take the skills we used to analyze works of art to solve problems they have back in their real lives. Okay, how did you come up with the idea of using art as a means of teaching problem solving? Well, I wish I could take full credit for it, but I really can't. Uh, the idea was neither mine originally nor rocket science. Uh, I am a recovering attorney, and when I left the practice of law, I went to work at the Frick Collection here in New York, which is a gem of an art museum. And while I was there, I heard about a program that they were doing up at Yale. And the idea was very simple. They were taking medical students out of their clinical setting, out of the hospital, bringing them to an art museum, the Yale Center for British Art, and teaching them how to analyze works of art with the hope that when they returned to the hospital, these medical students would be better observers of their patients. It was kind of, you know, humanities in medicine. And so I went to Yale to watch the program. And with Yale's very gracious permission, I started a, <coughs> excuse me, a version of that at the Frick Collection. And we did it, it was wonderful. We had medical students coming and going, but about four years into the program, I had this realization that these skills were in a far wider range of professions than just medicine. And I adapted the program in 2004 for law enforcement and the intelligence community. And it got some nice coverage and things exploded. And now I work across the professional spectrum, teaching all of these different people in all different walks of work how to look at works of art to solve their problems and enhance their perception. Okay, well that's that's interesting. So what can looking at art, or I guess more precisely, learning how to look at art, teach us about problem solving? There are two things. Uh, the first one is, as corny as it might sound, I'm gonna say that the best things happen at the exit ramp of our comfort zone. So by asking people to look at works of art, I'm taking them out of their comfort zone because 99.9% .9 of the people I work with don't look at art for a living. And the other reason art is so valuable in this context is it because it's a different set of data. It's just a completely different set of data than we're, it's, it's not what we're used to looking at every day. Some people who, who do look at art think of going to a museum. This is a completely different way of approaching how we look at art and giving your left brain a rest and engaging your right brain in a way that when you that hopefully when you return to using your left brain, you'll see things more perceptively. To steal a quote from one of my colleagues, he says, "Neurons that fire together wire together." And I hope to let to show people how to engage those neurons by looking at works of art, so that they'll engage later to solve their problems. You know, um, there was a. <clears throat> I got to say throughout this book, I'm going to say this several times for, for our audience who are quality professionals, there is a lot of overlap in concepts in here. One that really struck me, um, in your chapter, uh, Clean Your Lenses, you talk about a woman, th th there was a piece of art that a woman didn't, uh, she didn't like, and she told her, I don't like this. So you kept asking her why, you kept trying to mm -hmm. drill down why, and she gave you an answer, and you kind of follow up, well, well, why did you give me that answer? And you kept kind of asking her why, to kind of drill down to get to the root cause of mm -hmm. why she really yeah. didn't like that piece of art, other than just, I just don't like it. 
In our industry, there is a process called the five whys, which is the same thing. You know, uh, something's wrong. Well, why, why is it broken? Well, the power turned off. Well, why did the power turn off? Well, somebody flipped the switch. Why did they flip the switch? Oh, well, they didn't know any, but whatever, right? You drill down into it. The thing that's different and that I found interesting is in our five whys process, it's all external. It's looking at the thing that's not working and going, well, why doesn't it work? It's very mechanical, very external. Your five whys was drilling down into a person's bias. And I thought that was fascinating. I want to know from you, why is that important in problem solving? Well, I, I really like the way you broke that apart about those, those five whys. And I think you hit on a very key point. When we're looking at art, we're invoking the subjective. You know, people automatically bring to the surface what it is that they don't like. And what I try to do is make people aware of those biases in a very non-threatening way and really get to the heart of what the problem is. And so one of the takeaways when we have to clean our lenses is I can't change people's biases, but I can make them aware of them. So by breaking it down into these digestible pieces or questions and say, well, what do you, you know, why do you think this and why do you see this and breaking it down we remove that subjectivity in a really non-threatening way. I'll give you one more example. Uh, I juxtapose two paintings of nude women. One is from the 18th century, one is from the 20th century. And I put them side by side and I asked a group of nurses, you know, what do you see? What are the similarities between these two paintings? And a woman raised her hand and she said, I see two women who are angry at being objectified by male artists. And I said, okay. A. And so we stepped back and we deconstructed the same way. We talked about the word anger and objectification versus being painted by the artist. And when the session was over, she came up to the podium and she said, you know, you could have made mincemeat of me out there. She <laughs> said, but you made me realize that I was projecting my own feelings on something that was really very objective. And instead of wagging your finger and shaking your finger at me and saying, don't do that, you made me walk my own statements back. And it's, it's just a different way. And because we're using art to be able to do that, it's non-threatening and it gives people a lot, of, a lot of wiggle room. And I'm not taking them to task. I'm, not, I'm asking them to look and correspond what they're saying to what they're seeing. That, that's, I, 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 you just said something I think was kind of critical there to me is rather than looking at, let's say, a workplace issue mm -hmm. and focusing on the workplace issue and trying to tackle it while everybody's all messed up in their head about that issue, you're removing it by kind of applying the same, talking about the same thing, but w in relationship to art. And you're, you're saying that helps people talk more freely about it, yes. even though they're talking about maybe the same issues, it's about a piece of art, not what's actually happening in, in their workplace. That's exactly right. And so the, another example I can give you is if I have two, say I have two homicide detectives in front of two different, in front of two paintings, and I'll say, treat them as crime scenes. Tell me everything you see, who you want to question, and what questions you have. And somehow when you're, when you're changing the data and I'm not showing them actual crime scenes, they're very open, they're very candid because they don't feel that I'm testing their particular skills. And you know, the beautiful thing about art is everybody sees something. None of us see the same thing. So my question can be, well, who in this painting would you want to question to find out you know, the most you can, what's happening in the painting? And people will have very different takes on that question. And I say, if you do that here in the art museum, imagine what you're doing at the crime scene or in the boardroom or at the, or at the department meeting. And so the, the skills are readily transferable, but the venue and the context in which we're looking at those skills is completely removed. And that's why a museum is such a wonderful place to be because when you change your environment, you change the way you see. So, so the goal here then is to help them recognize their own, I don't know, biases or, or uh, deficiencies in perception, recognize what, recognize that they have them and then they can take that recognition when they go back to their actual real job? Yes. Another thing, I, I want to make a correlation for them to make sure they understand the power of words because seeing and perceiving and communicating what you see and perceive are two very, very different things. And one of the things about problem solving when we talk about cleaning your lenses and changing your shoes, this is all a metaphorical way of saying, let's pause here. 
let's pause, let's see the problem, let's articulate the problem, let's look at it from different angles. And Frank Bruni wrote not too long ago uh, during the pandemic, he wrote about the value of a pause. And you know, we've all been on a forced pause in this pandemic. And he said that a pa during a pause, three things happen. It's when passions cool, civility gets oxygen, and wisdom finds its wings. And when it comes to problem solving, the idea of letting passions cool and thinking about new wisdom, new ways, you know, when wisdom can find its wings, it's a new way to approach the problem, but we often need to pause. And when we're looking at art together, I say, five seconds before you say anything about this sculpture, just look for five seconds. And people are amazed at how they can collect their thoughts and get rid of extraneous ideas, what they want to say. You know, it, it, it's, it's funny, and I, I, I sent you an email about this early. What you just, des just described, many readers in our, in our audience will recognize similarities to something called the Ono Circle. Uh, Taiichi yes. Ono was the founder of the Toyota Production System, and he had this thing where he would take people out onto the shop floor, he'd draw a circle, a CEO usually say, stand there and watch. Because forced to stand there, they would slowly start to absorb things uh, around them. Um, you know, I, I got a question here. Um, so are you teaching your students just to recognize their own biases and then apply that in perception issues? Or is, is there also some practical perception teaching kind of uh, lessons going on as well? How to, how to see things, I guess. Yeah. It also in incorporates the latter. Before we get to innovative problem solving, I give them this practical template uh, that has evolved over the years of my teaching. And it's very simple. You know, everybody I work with already has a full plate. I don't want to add to their plate, you know, do this and do this and follow this chart. It's very simple. It's four A's. Every new problem, every new production, every new client, every new product, any new situation, you practice four A's. And we do them every day. We just don't break them down this way. The first A is to assess your situation. All right, let's see what they, let's put parameters around the situation. Then let's analyze it. Let's figure out what do we need? What don't we have? What can we get rid of? What do we retain? How do we prioritize it? Then we articulate what the situation is. We articulate our assessment of what we see, and then we act. We make a decision. So we assess, we analyze, we articulate, and we act multiple times a day, but people forget how intertwined observation and perception are to those four A's. People want to, people always want to show you how smart they are. And they all arrive at a meeting and say, well, this is my suggestion for a solution. Why don't we go around the table and articulate what we think the problem is before we articulate a solution? So those four A's are, are the foundation of the idea of visual intelligence and looking at works of art. And then we take it to the next step leverage those four A's to help us solve problems. Okay. Um, I want to I, I wanna share a, a, a picture from your book here. I'm just going to do a quick share screen here. Sure. Uh, this was, this was a, uh, a, uh, an installation that you had in, in, your, in your book here. I'm just reading this, uh, yes. from my notes here. Uh, One of my favorites. And yeah, this is very, in, it's, uh, for our audience, this is, just, this is just a small portion of a large installation <laughs> called 100 Spaces by Rachel uh, Whiteread. These are actually resin casts of the space underneath chairs. So imagine you had a chair uh, uh, and, and you were able to, you know, put something around it and fill it with resin. This is, <laughs> this is what is underneath chairs. Now, my question is, how would you use this? How would you use this image to, to teach something? Well, it's, as I said, it's one of my favorites. And I put the slide up and before I tell the participants in my session what it is, I say, well, what do you see here? And people tell me all kinds of things. They say they look like jello shots. They look like <laughs> probably ranchers, you know, big sucking candies. And I explained to them that what the artist did is she took 100 chairs, it's called 100 spaces. And she thought about the negative space under a hundred different chairs. And she used that as the inspiration to create the hundred different sculptures in wax and resin in a whole array of brilliant colors. And the takeaway from this is that this artist, we look, we all sit in chairs, right? We're all sitting in chairs now. Who really thinks about the negative space under a hundred different chairs? Almost nobody. So what I wanna do for my participants is give them new lenses 
to see existing resources in a different way. This is not the time when we can bring in new ideas, and new resources, and spend money. We're, you know, we're coming out of a pandemic. How can we look at the resources that we already have with a new set of lenses to help us solve problems? So the way Rachel White Reed thought about the negative space under a chair as her source for 100 sculptures, how can we take another look around where we are and say, I'm going to look at this differently? And this doesn't just mean physical resources. How do we look at people differently? How do we look at human resources differently? So that's how I use the hundred spaces to get us to think differently about what we see. Uh, that's that, that's that's really fascinating. I see, I see what you're saying there too, and on, on how you've connected the dots between what Rachel did and how people can apply that same idea to their to their surrounding, or or like you said, to, to people as well. You know, um, mm -hmm. my my final question for you this is uh, this was towards the end of the, your book. You write that. Um, Fumio Nanjo, uh, director of the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, believes that art will be key to problem solving in the future because it's the only field without restrictions. Do you agree with that and why? I do, to a certain extent. Uh, when I first read it in my research, I thought, what a, what a groundbreaking thought. But the truth is, creativity is all about problem solving. Creativity is finding new and innovative, innovative ways to do different things. So it's really sort of a micro application of creativity. And I think when we don't have restrictions, when we're free to think about creating things and then understanding with those different lenses that I talk about during the, throughout the book of changing your lenses and looking at things differently, we can see solutions that we didn't even think of before. You know, it's amazing when you stumble onto something and it doesn't just solve the problem at hand, it solves future problems or situations in the past. And I really do agree with that sentiment because I think that we have become so linear, linear and polarized in that linear thinking that we're afraid, you know, we go from point A to point B, but we forget what's at, what's at point, point D and how can we still get to point B, but taking a different route. So I do support that statement. And I love to think that so many of these problems can, if they can't be solved by creative means, at least we can use a creative means to rethink the problem. All right, very interesting. Um, well, uh, Amy, I, I want to, uh, again, uh, tell all of our audience, uh, uh, all of you pro quality professionals out there, that I really liked Fixed, uh, Amy's book Fixed. I, I, to me, it just so many carryovers into what we do in our own field. Uh, you'll see a lot of similarities there, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So, Amy, once again, for, for being here with us, I appreciate it this morning. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure uh, talking to you. All right, and thanks to all of you, of course, for joining us. Uh, if there is a guest you'd like us to bring on a show or some topic you'd like us to cover, just let us know. Email us at qdl at qualitydigest.com. I'll do my best. That is it for today, and we will see you at the next QDL. So long.